Hey, 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 welcome to Spax Attack. You're probably like, that's not a Mitch. You're <laughs> damn right. It's not Mitch. Spencer Israel here with Chris Kachi filling in for Mitch today. Uh, but it doesn't mean we have any, uh, it doesn't mean we don't have a good show for you because we got always, always a good show for the good people of Benzinga's YouTube. So uh, we'll get to some stocks we're watching. We'll do get to our interview. A lot to get to before we proceed any further. Mitch would, would come over and kill me if I didn't first say, smash that like button on YouTube, hit share, hit subscribe, share us on Twitter, share us on MySpace, do it all. We appreciate that. Uh, and now let's go. First, Chris, how you doing today, man? How you doing? Doing great. Doing great. How about you, Spencer? I'm hanging in there. I'm hanging in there. I'm, I'm, I'm operating on not much sleep, but I think neither, not many of us have slept well in the last few nights. And it's, it's been one of those weeks, crazy markets, crazy times, a lot crazy, to get to. crazy week. What yes. a, what a week to be in the, in this financial industry here. Historic is all you can say. All right, let's go behind the headlines. All right, guys. So want to dive into headlines today. So up first, we have Ride, R-I-D-E. This is Lordstown Motors. Uh, so shares are trading higher today. Um, they did get an upgrade from Wolf Research, upgrading them from underperform to peer perform and raising their price target from $14 to $27. So again, we've talked this week about Lordstown Motors, how they're a possible um, winner with the Biden administration talking of switching the government fleet vehicles. Um, to electric. So keep an eye out on Lordstown Motors here with that news out. And then, of course, we had a couple SPACs, um, you know, with uh, Kathy Wood's ARC funds. Uh, so no new uh, names, but she did add to existing positions. So EXPC, which is taking urban air mobility company Blade Public, um, she added another 144,000 shares to uh, ARC-Q yesterday. And then Skills, SKLZ, um, added an additional 268,000 shares to the ARC W ETF. Um, so two names that she has bought several times now. So it looks like she is a big fan of those companies. Um, and obviously, you know, they trade higher on that news. So keep an eye out on those two names going forward. One of the big winners yesterday was IPOE. So this, of course, is a Chamath Polyhop TS SPAC. Merging with SoFi, a uh, fintech name. Uh, so shares were up 11% yesterday. Um, was in the news a lot as it's seen as a possible winner throughout all the regulations this week. So Robinhood, um, you know, and some other brokerages stopped trading on certain tickers that have been trading, um, you know, crazy throughout this week. SoFi did not restrict, um, you know, any trading. And they did uh, get some tweets out about that from CEO Anthony Noto and also from Chamath. So as there's kind of a call to boycott and delete Robinhood, um, you know, people are looking for alterna alternatives. And SoFi is seen as a possible winner. So keep an eye out on this one. And then PSAC, another big runner yesterday. Uh, so they announced that merger with Faraday Future, the luxurious uh, electric vehicle company. Um, shares were up 18% yesterday, you know, keep an eye out on this one as you know, they have this high growth plan. And if they can hit on the numbers that they project, um, you know, it looks like to be a major player in both luxury and mass market electric vehicles in the future. Um, so definitely watching PSAC here. We had a couple of rumors yesterday. Um, so up first, we have Fuse, F-U-S-E, uh, Bloomberg is reporting that they're in talks to take Money Lion public. Um, Money Lion has over 4 million customers. Um, you know, this one shot a little bit higher yesterday, but has already come down. Um, you know, so again, this is just a rumor. Um, looks like not too many people, you know, either getting excited about this or buying into the rumor yet. Um, but we'll keep an eye on it. As I know, Fuse has been one of the, um, you know, highly talked about SPACs out there with lots of interest. Other rumor yesterday was BOWX. Um, they're one of one of the SPACs named uh, in a report that we work um, is working on a SPAC deal. Um, so again, you know, it, it just depends if this deal gets announced. And also that report did say um, that they were exploring offers with several SPACs, um, but BOWX was the one that really stood out. 
so keep an eye on that one. And then we had a couple deals announced this morning. Um, ALUS is up first. So this is Alessa Energy Acquisition. Um, they announced that they're taking uh, a Norway-based developer of clean next-generation battery cells public. Um, the deal values that company at $1.4 billion. Um, I don't have all the details in front of me. We'll dive into that one next week. Um, but definitely keep an eye out on this one. It is up 20%. Uh, and again, in that kind of sweet spot of clean energy and battery tech, um, you know, going forward. And then our other announced deal was uh, TPG Pace, which is symbol P-A-C-E. Uh, they're taking Nerdy public in a SPAC deal. So Nerdy is an online learning platform. Uh, this values the company at $1.4 billion. They have revenue of $106 million in fiscal 2020, which was up 16%. And then they estimate... 2021 revenue of $138 million, up 38% year over year. Um, you know, so we've talked before how online learning and some of these, uh, you know, education technology companies could be a big story in 2021 with the pandemic, with people learning from home, and also just, you know, everything shifting to online. So not too surprised to see a company, um, you know, like Nerdy get a SPAC deal. Um, so keep an eye out on this one. Um, and we'll dive into that one again next week. I do want to throw out another spec to watch. Um, this is symbol FGNA. Again, just you know to make sure all our viewers are aware. So this spec um, is led by the former CEO of uh, TD Ameritrade, and he will be appearing on CNBC Monday morning. Um, so it. Don't know if he's going to announce a deal or if he's just coming on to talk the overall market and some of those brokerages, um, you know, having problems yesterday. But I'm definitely keeping an eye on it. And I did buy shares, um, taking a stab at that in case a deal is announced. So FGNA, um, keep that one on your watch list. And then turning to our calendar, we have a vote today, NOVS, voting on that merger with App Harvest, an indoor agriculture company. Um, and then we have several deals uh, next week. Um, so PCPL, AMCI, both on February 2nd, and then FSDC on February 3rd. Um, so three deals on the calendar for next week with those vote dates. Um, so keep an eye out for those ones as well as we go into those mergers. Um, and that's what I've got for headlines today, Spencer. All right. Good stuff, as always. How do you keep up with all this, man? Seriously. I How spend you... so much time looking at these specs. I follow a lot of great people out there. Um, you know, on Twitter, we have a great SPAC community, um, you know, that I'm happy to be a part of. And, you know, you, you just got to spend the time and the research. And luckily for me, I've always had, you know, a good memory going back to school. So these tickers and all this stuff can, you know, keep up there and keep with it. Yeah. All right, what's next? We have, um, let me see here. We got SPACs to watch or are we going to our interview? Let's let's dive right into that interview. It looks like right. Kyle's here. Let's do it. So let's bring on our guest here, Kyle Detweiler. He's the CEO of Clever Leaves, joining us now on SPACs Attack. Kyle, good morning or good afternoon, whatever time of day it is, wherever. How's it going? Good here. Yeah, good morning, guys. Uh, I, I, before we even get into it, Chris, I just want to jump in for a second. Um, what do you make of the craziness out there? Pretty crazy stuff, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it's the democratization of investing. It's 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 upending a lot of traditional norms. Um, it's pretty interesting to watch. Uh, you know, I came from the investment community, so you know, I kind of can kind of see both sides. Um, but you know, the 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 excitement hasn't yet touched uh, you know some of the cannabis companies. So I think that's only a matter of time uh, before it happens. And uh, you know, I might have. Had a childhood memory of going into a GameStop and selling my GoldenEye game to go buy some pizza or something like that. So uh, I get that it's a little bit more of an iconic business at this point than cannabis companies, which are all much newer. Yeah. Sorry, Chris, I'll let you run with that. I just wanted to ask that. No, that's perfect. I, I love the GoldenEye reference there. Yeah, I think, you know, a lot <laughs> of us, you know, remember GameStop, the the physical part of it. And now, you know, as they look to grow the e-commerce, but definitely a, a crazy um, market out there. So um, before we dive into questions, I think we have a video um, to play about your company. So, uh, Mitch, if you want to go ahead and play that video.
Mitch, we don't have sound. Let's see if we, let's see if we can get that sound up. It's a very nice looking video, but I can't hear what can't hear what, what it's playing. So, apologies for that. But uh, Kyle can tell us the gist of it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you're you're looking at one of the largest cannabis companies on planet Earth. Uh, so, you know, Cleverly's today is is a very different beast. Uh, you know, a lot of people built. Uh, cannabis production in the places where it first was legal, you know, the U.S. or or Canada. You know, we said, let's think fashion forward. Let's think ten years forward. What what will be the Tesla of of cannabis? Um, um, and 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 so we said, you know, let's go where cannabis should grow, uh, which is in countries like Colombia or maybe a country like Portugal. Uh, so we're the largest cannabis uh, uh, company by my measures uh, in Colombia. We have 1.9 million square feet of of greenhouses. I mean. A big producer in California might have, you know, a quarter of that. Uh, but the more interesting thing is from a business, business fundamental side, you know, we produce cannabis at 90 percent lower uh, than uh, in costs uh, than our peers. So not only, you know, are we the way to bring Colombian cannabis to, you know, markets like the uh, like Canada and the U.S. someday. Uh, but we're uh, we're a pretty lethal business uh, in terms of our scale and, and cost advantage. All right. Perfect. I think we've got that video um set up here so let's take a look at that first here clever leads is built around a single idea that cannabis production up until recently was built where it was legal not where it was environmentally or economically optimal we plan to disrupt the industry by creating a new solution a federally legal operating model built upon capital efficiency and ecological soundness at Cleverleaves, we currently have two cultivation sites, one located outside of Bogotá in Colombia and another one located outside of Lisbon in Portugal. Totaling 1.9 million square feet of cultivation ranks among the largest in the world by capacity. The sites were specifically selected in the most attractive microclimates in the world for cannabis cultivation and the facilities were purposely constructed for optimal operating efficiency levering natural sunlight, year-round cultivation, uh, opener greenhouses, we leverage rainwater for irrigation, and we also cultivate at 8,300 feet of elevation that simplifies pest management in Colombia. Now, our focus on quality begins at our cultivation sites. Both operate under GACP standards, and actually our Colombian site is EU GMP certified for the production of dried cannabis flour. U.S. and Canadian operators produce cannabis for an average of $2 a gram. Our capital and operating efficiencies allow us to produce cannabis product for 20 cents a gram, 90% cheaper. All right. Yeah. So great video there. Kind of getting to the, you know, the, the meat of the bones for um, Clever Leaves here. So I want to take a step back. And so obviously this is SPACs attack. We cover SPACs and IPOs on the show. Um, so Clever Leaves decided to go public uh, via a SPAC. Um, so can you talk a little bit, what, what made the decision to go public via a SPAC over maybe a traditional IPO? And how, how long was this kind of in the works um, wanting to go public? Yeah, we, we started the process uh, early in 2020. So, you know, almost a year ago. And, you know, there, the two paths, of course, were to, 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 to sell the company to somebody that might have been interested in it, uh, to go public via an IPO or, or use a SPAC. And, and I really do think that the SPAC structure, you know, it, it's been around for a while, but sort of the, the innovation of it is, is now starting to, uh, to, to, to really catch on. And so we, uh, you know, we liked the idea of having a, a, a knowledge that, you know, we could raise approximately a hundred million dollars of cash. We ended up raising, you know, about 91, 92 or so. Um, and that would be a little less uh, possible in an IPO. An IPO, you know, you kind of skid into it, whereas uh, a SPAC transaction, you're kind of locked on a target. You know, you let the share price trade early so the market can, can kind of self-determine whether or not it's a good transaction. Um, and, and so that's why we picked this back pack. Awesome. So um, I know we saw in the video about cost there. Um, so how and are your production costs so much lower um, than some of the competitors like Aurora and Tilray? Yeah, the, the biggest reason is, you know, most of our peers in Canada or the United States have to trick, they have to play a game on cannabis. 
you know, we like to say that, you know, what when you build a hundred million dollar greenhouse in in uh, in a province like Alberta, where it, you know it could be dark for most of the winter, and you know it snows, and you know it's it's freezing out. Uh, you might also be located near an airport, which which makes no sense. Um, you know, those facilities have to trick the plant into feeling like it's in, you know, the Bogota savanna. And that's what we get for free. So we don't have to have, uh, you know, buildings built to withstand snowstorms. Uh, we don't have to use supplemental lighting so that we get sunlight year round. We get 12 hours of sunlight and 12, hour, 12 hours of darkness for free. You know, we don't have to disrupt major, uh, you know, water flows in our communities. We get 70% of our, our, our hydrological needs. Uh, from the rain. So, you know, we're a sustainable solution and that's just very different. But, you know, if you want to grow cannabis in, in, in the tundra, uh, you know, that's what it takes. Kyle, maybe we should start with, can you explain your, your business? Uh, sure. I mean, you know, we're, we're one of the lowest cost producers of cannabis in the world. We're located in the most ecological and environmentally friendly re uh, regions to produce it. And, you know, unlike um, a lot of our peers uh, outside of North America, we have gone out to receive pharmaceutical grade certifications, uh, which attest to our quality. So Cleverly is the only one of what I estimate to be four companies in the world to have what they call EU GMP certification. That's the same certification that if you want to sell Humira or Lipitor in a pharmacy in Germany, you have to have that type of certification to attest to quality, traceability, and other uh, uh, other standards. And there just aren't, isn't really another alternative like us uh, out there. But you're not yet selling in the U.S., correct? We, we have the Controlled Substances Act. So we're a NASDAQ-listed company. That's, what, that's exactly why I was asking. I was like, how can they list on the NASDAQ? That's exactly what I was wondering. That's right. that's the trick. But I think it's changing. I mean, listen, you know, I can produce, you know, Cleverly's can produce more cannabis than, you know, most of the American cannabis companies put together. But we've got a barrier. And when that barrier starts to break down or even just a piercing of the armor, armor starts to happen, I think that will be a game changer. And Biden has talked about federally legal medical cannabis. So I might not be able to sell recreational product in the next you know, 12 months, but there's a good chance we could get medical product in the U.S. And that would really just upend the industry. We can bring down the cost of it. Weed is way too expensive in the U.S. We are a solution to that. And, and, it, and it, it's about to happen in, in, in the next couple of years. All right. So before we dive into all those, those great U.S. questions and that new administration, I want to hit on some of the areas you're already in. So um, Latin America, you know, I've seen talks that Colombia uh, could be the largest market. Uh, you also have a deal with Canopy Growth, um, you know, to to supply them. So, uh, you know, how does this help validate Clever as a market leader, and why is Latin America so important to the company? Yeah. Well, let's start with the canopy question, right? Canopy is, you know, by most measures, uh, the largest cannabis company in the world. They have the most cash, one of the largest market caps. So they're the most sophisticated. They know how to root out a good supplier and a bad uh, supplier, you know, much more than, um, you know, anybody else. And when canopy was active down in Latin America, their initial strategy was to build down there. You know, they were going to try to build a production center. Uh, build the cultivation that we have, build the extraction facilities. And when new leadership came into Canopy, they said, wait a minute, Canopy doesn't need to be everything to everyone. Um, you know, they don't necessarily own all of their, uh, you know, beer making equipment over at Constellation. You know, there's a way to do this that can kind of leverage their competency, which is a focus on building and dominating the brand side but leveraging partners uh, throughout the world who are best in class. And so even though they had their own alternative to build and continue finishing their own facility, they said the Clever Leafs guys are much further ahead. You know, they have an opportunity to, you know, do this without investing more dollars. You know, they don't have to build any production. You know, we could sell them products the next day. Um, and so I think it goes to show that out of all of the stories that have been told in Colombia, every PowerPoint presentation that you said, you've seen, Canopy Growth, the most sophisticated cannabis company, arguably in the entire world, has checked us out and said, these guys are better than, you know, the other peers. And, you know, we think they're a good commercial, trustworthy group. They do what they say. Um, they, they don't do what they say they won't do. Um, and that was a pretty important uh, quality validation. You know, Canopy hasn't hasn't done that with anybody else in Latin America. And then if we turn to Europe. Um, you know, so I've seen mentioned that the great thing there is that price points are higher. 
um, and there's less competition. So can you kind of talk about those two key points for Club Relieves? Yeah, it's it's tough as an American for, for me to convey how different Europe's cannabis market is to the U.S. In Germany, there are no dispensaries. You know, you have to go to a true physician to get a prescription. Those prescriptions can only be obtained after you've, you know, kind of proven that a number of other therapies didn't work. It's very, very uh, difficult. Uh, however, you know, for companies that are willing to, you know, produce product to a pharmaceutical grade standard, of which there are very few in the world, arguably there's only about about a dozen in the world that can sell flower products of that grade, and maybe less than half a dozen that can sell extracts of that grade. Um, it, it's it's an interesting market, right? So there's a lot of barriers to to en entry there. You know, it's high high entry costs, and so that's a really interesting uh, place for cleverly. So you know, an American, uh, you know, might the average price to buy cannabis in the United States might be I don't know about five bucks a gram. In Germany, it's probably north of twenty two dollars a gram. Uh, so that's a huge difference. But you know, there are reasons you can imagine if you're going into a pharmacy to get cannabis as opposed to you know, buying it from Ease or some other, uh, you know, dispenser nearby you, um, it could be a little bit more expensive. And, and but you also get that quality protection. You know, it's being prescribed for far, by a pharmacist. You know, it's safe. You know, the quality's there. You know, there's no contaminants. You know, what they say is on the label is what's in the in, in the container, you know, that kind of thing. Awesome. And then I know you've talked a lot about that EU GMP certification. So how hard was that to obtain? How many years of you know work was this? And then I know you said there's very few out there. Um, which competitors out there have the same certification? Yeah, so cleverly is before we you know went public through our SPAC process, we raised over hundred and thirty million dollars US of capital. You know, that, that's a very big startup in 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 most parts of the world, especially when you're talking about you know Colombian and, and Portuguese cannabis. So we started the company in 2016, but it took us four years to get that GMP certification. You know, for, for people to try to understand what it's like, think about like a drug trial. You know, it might take a company like Pfizer, you know, four years to get a product through, you know, basic clinical development, phase one, phase two, maybe phase three. That can take years and it takes a lot, a lot of money. And, you know, producing ingredients for pharmaceutical products, you know, kind of have similar development and certification timelines. And so that's, you know, that's, that's why we are one of the only ones uh, uh, in the world that has it and, and certainly the only one in Latin America at, at this point. Um, and in terms of the other peers, you know, the other, uh, you know, players that can both cultivate cannabis uh, as well as turn it into an extract, isolate or other, you know, kind of infused product, uh, you know, other three peers are up in Canada. You know, we, we estimate it's, it's, uh, it's Tilray, it's Afria, uh, it's Aurora, you know, two of those companies maybe now combining. So we could be going from a group of four people that can kind of do what we do, uh, at least to the best of my knowledge, you know, down to three. Uh, again, the main difference though is our operating costs are 90% lower than those peers. You know, we're, the way to think about it is, you know, in the 1980s, uh, before people started to make manufacturing of pharmaceuticals in Southeast Asia, it was all done in you know, Germany and uh, New Jersey, very expensive places. Uh, but, you know, when people in India proved that you can produce the same quality ingredients at a fraction of the cost, it changes an entire industry. It changes the quality of care for people around the world, uh, and it lowers that price point for, for consumers. And that's exactly what Cleverly's mission is. And then I want to turn back to um, the U.S. market. So, you know, new administration here, uh, you know, you, you sound very bullish overall on U.S. possibly, you know, working on some new legislation. So what do you see kind of as the timeline uh, on a federal level or are we still looking at state by state here in the U.S.? Yeah, if, if I knew the answer to that question, I'm sure Cleverly's would, uh, you know, be a very, very successful company. So whatever I say, you know, there's a bit of guessing in this, you know, but I think we are within a, a federal action to be implemented, not just passed, but to be implemented in the next two years. And, and what that looks like, the shape, I'm not sure. You know, to be honest, I don't think most investors in the U.S., are sitting there asking about whether the big bad boogeymen from Colombia are going to be able to import this wave of cannabis. They're just trying to figure out whether the Californians are going to be able to bring it in to Massachusetts. 
And I'm pretty sure that, you know, the interstate commerce clause and just tradition across industries is going to lend itself to a freely traded market. If you're in a, you know, um, a liquor store in Massachusetts, which has some of the most restrictive laws in the country, you know what you find there? You find Jack Daniels made in Tennessee and you find Grey Goose made in France. And I think that's sort of the future of, of, of the way this, this will look. You know, this isn't like Internet gambling where, you know, there are state reasons it's done at home. You know, this is a product. It's a physical ingredient. It's like a pharmaceutical product or, or, or alcohol. So I think that's what it could look like. Additionally, when you don't have, you know, a strong Republican personality in the White House, you know, setting, you know, your own views of politics aside, you know, Biden has encouraged other countries, you know, through his election to be more bullish on cannabis. You know, what was one of the first things that happened right after the electoral college results seemed to indicate that Biden was going to win? Israel announced they were going to try to create a recreational program within nine months. And so Cleverly's is a fantastic investment in a world in which there is more legalization. When countries stop the senseless war on, uh, on, on cannabis and begin to legalize, that will be a great thing. So, you know, you're seeing that movement in Israel. You're seeing it in, in Europe over in the Netherlands where they're launching their first uh, recreational experience. I think you're going to see it in places like Germany. You know, Spain could be soon. Um, that's, that's sort of even outside of the U.S., a Biden administration means great things for this industry and for Clever Leaves. So what would be the the next steps if uh, the U.S. approval level, um, you know, how quickly could a company like Clever Leaves, um, you know, expand and really build out a presence here in the U.S.? Well, one of, you know, one of the best things is, you know, we don't need to build any more cultivation. We don't need to build extraction capabilities. Um, you know, we have a lot of capacity. I can put up another million square feet of greenhouse, you know, with a very small investment. You know, it might cost people hundreds of millions of dollars in the U.S. It might cost us, you know, 15 or 20 uh, down down in Colombia. So that could all be done very, very quickly. And we can always re-divert product that we're sending to Germany uh, uh, or Australia to, to the U.S. So that's the easy part. I think that the hard part will be, you know, what are the regulations? You know, what type of products need to get uh, 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 sent? What's the distribution going to look like? You know, if if it follows the course of a normal medical product, like something that you could, uh, you know, get at a pharmacy at a CVS or a Walgreens, I'd say we'd actually be pretty quickly enabled. Now, it just depends on what the FDA says about that um, and, you know, how physicians sort of start to prescribe products. Um, so, you know, we'll just have to wait and see on that one. And then I want to talk a little bit. So you guys own uh, Herbal Brands, um, which does have a presence here in the U.S. for the CBD side of things. So can you talk a little bit about that brand? America, what does that mean for, for Clever Leaves as far as the U.S. presence? Yeah, of course. You know, what do you do when you're a company that wants to abide by federal law, but you don't want to see the U.S. opportunity pass you by? You know, we decided we would go buy something that creates products that could be used or distributed uh, through a cannabis system someday when, once legalized. So we bought a, a small business that makes nutraceutical beverages and detox products. They sell to, you know, great retail partners like uh, GNC, Vitamin Shop, Walgreens, CVS. You know, so if that is a forum for cannabis products to flow through at some point, you know, coming back to your question about how have we enabled ourselves to quickly enter, you know, we have a beverage manufacturing facility in Tempe, Arizona. We have a sales force that already speaks to these retailers. We have relationships in, with them. We're set up with, uh, you know, UPC codes. Everything's kind of ready uh, uh, to go and we could use that channel. So we plan to launch a CBD topical product uh, in 2021 using that platform. Um, and, you know, also most people think you can just, you know, design a CBD product and it's going to sell or a THC product, but, you know, you need a design team. You got to pick a marketing image. You got to get, you know, trademarks and, and, um, and, you know, validate your stability so you can have good shelf life. That kind of expertise existed within herbal brands and we hope to unlock it this year. And then I want to talk a little bit about um, finances. So one of the things from, the investor presentation talked about, um, you know, 2021 being the year to really grow um, rapidly. So what kind of growth are you looking at in terms of revenue and um, talk a little bit about profitability down the road? 
Yeah. Well, I, I think, you know, a company like Cleverly is, is, is clearly, um, you know, it's just such a disruptive story. You know, I can't tell you exactly when we're going to get product into the U.S. Or, or Canada, which has also been been difficult to import in. But, you know, it's pretty easy to see when it happens. You know, Cleverly's revenue is not going to grow by, you know, five or 10 percent a year. It's, you know, we're talking about hundreds of percentage points per year uh, of growth. So that's sort of the magnitude to think about. And in terms of the profitability as well, that's the beauty of the, the business as well. I mean, you know, for a company with 500 employees globally, you know, our cash burn per month in, in a no revenue scenario is, is maybe two or three million dollars a month. You know, a typical company of our size in Canada might, in a no revenue scenario, have to spend, you know, 20 to 50 million dollars a month. Um, and so that advantage, you know, creates a very powerful torque. Uh, so we should be able to get to cash flow, uh, you know, positive in 2021. Um, not sure if it'll, you know, the whole year will be kind of measured as a cash flow positive year, but we should get to cash flow positive, hopefully, uh, by the end of the year, if a couple of things go our way. Awesome. So. Uh, I want to turn a little bit to uh, m and so mergers and acquisitions. Uh, you know, what do you see as the trend for cannabis? We've had several large deals announced um, in the sector. And is Clever Leaves looking toward any acquisitions um, down the road and what space would be targeted? One of, yeah, one of the most unique things about you know, the SPAC transaction that we completed is that Clever Leaves has access now to approximately $80 million of cash at the snap of a finger. You know, we don't have to raise it. Uh, we don't have to go, you know, make a filing. You know, that cash is ready to go once our board approves a transaction. So we're definitely out there looking. We're going to be very, very thrifty. Um, you know, the lesson of 2020 uh, taught me that, you know, treat every dollar like it could be your last because it very well could be. Uh, so we're going to be very, very uh, careful. You know, we what we don't need is we don't need to go buy production. Um, that's what people might want to buy Cleverly's for as a company. They might acquire us just to get access to that magnitude of production. So I think we're going to look at, you know, what acquisitions can enable us to send our product out uh, into the world. You know, those could be distribution companies like herbal brands in the U.S. They could be distribution companies in, in Europe or Canada or, or, in, or in Latin America. So I think that's sort of the main thing. And then, of course, depending on how the laws work in the U.S., if there's an opening for us to come into the U.S., $80 million of cash is going to make that a very uh, a much easier proposition. Awesome. I think we're going to turn back over uh, if Spencer's got some questions yeah, and then I, also I, I get to some questions uh, from our chat here. Yeah, I do, I do have a couple and I've compiled some from the chat. I just want to start off, uh, Kyle. Um, I'm sure you have observed in the last year or so there's been this divergence in terms of cannabis companies on the public market, right? It seems like the U.S.-based companies that don't trade on exchanges uh, have outperformed the the global ones that do trade on exchanges. Um, what what do you what do you make of, of, of that? Obviously, it's clever leaves. At, life as a public company is too young to be able to judge anything at all, really, right now. But what do you make of of this divergence? It's, it seems like the you know the canopies, the ones that have been around, uh, maybe aren't doing as well on the public side of things as the U.S. based companies that trade off exchange. Yeah, I, I think that's really the center of the theme. It's that most of the U.S. operators were not on the NASDAQ or the NYSC, and they happen to be the ones that have really had a great year. I mean, kudos to all my friends who who, who lead those businesses or work at those companies. It's a phenomenal year. I, I'm a big bull on the industry. I want cannabis. I, I used to be, you know, a just say no kind of person. It took me you know, five years to really kind of understand the power of what cannabis is. It's not what I thought it was when I had a dare drug officer show up in a police uniform <laughs> in elementary school. That's the wrong idea. And that wave is capturing the U.S. Now, it's, it's unfortunate that I have chosen a business model not to violate that law. I do respect the laws in the United States. That's why we have a former U.S. Senate Majority Leader, Tom Daschle, who supports Cleverly's because we want to do it right. You know, I realized we could kind of sneak over the line and, you know, maybe that means we would have made a little bit more money this year. But I do take the, the laws of this country very seriously. And so we're just going to wait until the government says, you know, um, uh, it, it's OK. But the image I got to think about is what's going to happen in two years. Right. 
everything today in the U.S. is about let's get that license in Georgia, let's get that license in you know West Virginia, let's great grow our market share, let's let's get the next celebrity to endorse that brand. Have you heard somebody talk about cost structure? Have you heard somebody talk about you know 210 million people in Brazil that only a handful of companies could supply? Have you heard anybody talk about the Netherlands recreational experiment? There's a billion people in in Europe and Brazil alone. That's you know three times the size of the U.S. market, and there are no MSOs that really have capability. So I think you know putting my crystal ball on MSOs, hot story of 2020, probably going to be a hot story in 2021. Once once people start thinking about well, what's next? You know, okay, the Canadians didn't really you know take off because you know growing cannabis in the tundra doesn't really make sense, but Europe, Brazil. Those are pretty interesting markets. So I think our good year is going to be about 12 months ahead of us. And when that story catches fire, I think it'll be a pretty powerful one. Interesting, because Canada was the hot story 2017, 2018, 2019, uh, until last year, like you said. So maybe there's just going to be that rotation away from North America uh, for once. Uh, a couple questions from our chat. Are you concerned about uh, tariffs, uh, essentially, uh, you know, that would be enacted to level the playing field, uh, U.S. based tariffs that that could that could affect you know your inflow your product. Of course, you know governments do that all the time. You know sugar, corn. You know whether it's a tariff or a subsidy. You know you you could kind of see that uh, developing. Um, you know also a lot of those tariffs for some of those industries started you know fifty or hundred years ago though. Yeah. Cannabis is relatively new. Uh, so, so we'll see. You know, it'd be one thing if there was cannabis operations in 50 states, um, and and you know we were kind of displacing that. I really think of us as sort of a new new addition, right? We create a special type of product. We're a special brand, Columbia. I mean, listen, if you brought illegal cannabis in the last 30 years, do you think you paid more for the cannabis that came from the Emerald Triangle in California, or do you think you paid more for what came from Medellin or Bogota? So we've got a provenance, right? Coffee in, you know, Colombian coffee is more valuable than, you know, American made coffee. And so I think that uh, that that story could help uh, as well. All right. I'm asking Kyle's question here. Uh, he's been very patient. So I'll just read this from the chat right now. Uh, Kyle from the chat, not Kyle, our guest. Uh, how Great does, name, though. Yeah. How does Colombia's current ban on cannabis flower exports uh, affect you guys? Do you expect this to be changed in the near future? And how would it affect your growth projections? Yeah, I mean, what, what if I were to tell you that, you know, despite us being one of the largest producers of cannabis in the world, I can't sell dried flour. But those rules could change. You know, that's that's baked into our current valuation is we can't sell it. But imagine if we could. And, you know, Uruguay has allowed the exports of flour. I think Colombia will get there. And, and you know, I love the Colombian regulation. I realize it's not a perfect economic choice. But think about what we're dealing with here, right? We're dealing with 30 to 40 years of a history, a scar, if you want to describe it that way, that the country is trying to turn into a beauty mark. They wanted to be very careful. They didn't want a lot of illicit products sneaking into the industry. So they said, let's regulate it. Let's make it just in the form of extracts. We can regulate that because there'll be very few companies that can build all of the capabilities that are necessary to get that far down the supply chain. And... So I think it's a good it's a good way to start. Again, yeah, maybe economically, I you know our company would make more money, we would sell more product, but I think in the long run, getting a suitably um, credible regulatory market in a country like Colombia, which certainly raised some eyebrows four years ago when we started to go down there, I think that was probably more important in the long run. All right, perfect. So. That's going to end our interview today. Um, you know, with all our questions, we were able to get some questions from the chat as well. So we want to thank our guests today. So Kyle Detweiler, the CEO of Clever Leaves, again, traded now as symbol CLVR. So Kyle, thanks for joining us on the show. We look forward to following the progress, um, you know, of your company now that you're publicly traded. Uh, so thanks for your time today. Thanks a lot, Kyle. Thank you, guys. All right, uh, Chris, I think that'll about wrap it up for us today. It's been a busy week, uh, busy day. It's not over yet. Uh, unless there's anything else you wanted to add, but I, I'm content to just to just <laughs> call it a week and go to sleep. Yeah, what what a crazy week. Um, yeah. You know, it's been some, some long days covering all these crazy moves in the market. So um, thanks to everyone for joining us on the show today. Thanks to Kyle, you know, for joining us. 
we want to bring you more CEO interviews. Um, we're working on getting some more lined up for next week. So stay tuned to us. Make sure you smash that like below. Subscribe to Benzinga. We've got more great shows throughout the day. Um, you know, so stay tuned for all the great market news and that SPAC coverage here on Benzinga. So we will see you next week. Thanks, guys. Have a good one, everyone.